Your Highness, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and we will now proceed to um, the Secretary General of NATO. And after the Secretary General's presentation, we'll have a brief Q&A session. And then you will enjoy a coffee break, if that's OK. So uh, uh, without further ado, uh, may I ask Jens Stoltenberg uh, to address this audience. Jens, you have the floor. Thank you, Wolfgang, and uh, it's really great to be back here at the Munich uh, Security Conference, a very important platform for uh, dialogue, and especially in times when we see high tensions and many uh, challenges as we see uh, now. And in the report for this uh, conference, you have uh, warned us all that we are moving towards uh, the brink of a significant uh, conflict. And my main message today is that uh, it is our common responsibility to enable us uh, to move away from that brink and to prevent uh, conflict. And in my introductory remarks, I will address uh, three issues which are key if we are to achieve exactly that. The transatlantic partnership, uh, EU efforts on uh, defense, and uh, nuclear challenges. First, some words about the transatlantic uh, partnership. In front of the new NATO headquarters, there are uh, two memorials. One is a section of the Berlin Wall, and the other a twisted girder from the wreckage of the Twin Towers in uh, New York. And uh, together they symbolize NATO's uh, steel-hard commitment to our collective defense and our solidarity in the fight against uh, terrorism. But most of all, they symbolize the unbreakable bond that unites the continents of uh, North America and uh, Europe. During the Cold War, NATO successfully deterred the Soviet Union. When the Cold War ended, we extended a hand of friendship to former adversaries and welcomed them into the Euro-Atlantic uh, family. NATO helped to end the uh, two wars uh, in the Balkans, and we remain in Afghanistan to ensure it never again becomes a safe haven for international terrorists. Without the enduring uh, power of the transatlantic partnership, none of this would have been uh, possible. But the paradox is that throughout our history, people have questioned the transatlantic partnership. From the Suez crisis to the Iraq war, from America's pivot to Asia, to perceived lack of support for Article 5 and unfair burden sharing, all of this has fueled an impression of weakening uh, transatlantic uh, bond. But the reality is that the bond has proven to be resilient because both Europe and North America benefit from the bond. What we see now is North Americans coming back to Europe, just as Europeans are stepping up their contributions to our shared security not just in words, but also in deeds. After the end of the Cold War, the United States reduced its military presence in Europe. In autumn 2013, the last American battle tank left Europe. Now the Americans are back with a new armored brigade. And this week, Washington ro rolled out a plan for further substantial increases in U.S. presence in Europe. Billions for equipment, pre-positioned supplies, training and infrastructure. Canadian troops have also returned to Europe for the first time in a generation, leading a multinational battle group in Latvia. But the transatlantic partnership is not a one-way street. European allies and Canada have stood with America 
in the fight against terrorism for the better part of two decades, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in Syria. European allies are also sharing the financial burden of our security. For years, defense spending by European allies and Canada was in decline. But in 2014, facing a changed security environment, all allies made a commitment to reverse that trend. We promised to stop the cuts, and the cuts have stopped. We promise to start increasing defense spending, and defense spending across Europe and Canada has increased for three consecutive years for the first time in many years. We promise to move towards spending 2% of GDP on defense within a decade. And we are moving. Remember that in 2014, only three allies met the 2% guideline. This year, we expect eight allies. And by 2024, we expect at least 15. All NATO allies have put forward plans to increase spending in real terms. This is major progress, and it is a very good start. But we still have a long way to go and hard work ahead. The simple message is the transatlantic alliance remains the most powerful, most effective, and most reliable alliance the world has ever seen. Because in times of need, we are all prepared to do what is necessary for our shared security. Let me <clears throat> turn to EU's efforts uh, on defense, which I know will be one of the main topics discussed during this uh, conference. I welcome EU efforts on defense. They are an opportunity to further strengthen the European pillar within NATO and contribute to better burden sharing. But with opportunity comes risk. The risk of weakening the transatlantic bond, the risk of duplicating what NATO is already doing, and the risk of discriminating against non-EU members of the NATO alliance. These risks must be avoided. The reality is the European Union cannot protect Europe by itself. European leaders themselves have underlined this point many times. NATO countries outside the EU play a fundamental role uh, in the defense of Europe. After Brexit, 80% of NATO's defense spending will come from non-EU allies. However, this is not only about money. It is also about geography. It is hard to imagine European security without the close involvement of Norway in the north, Turkey in the south, and the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom in the west. But if we remove the risks and make the most out of the opportunities, if the EU actions complement NATO, and are not seen as an alternative, then I see great potential for improving European security. That is why a closer NATO-EU cooperation is vital. NATO and EU are national partners. We share the same values, the same challenges, the same people. More than 90% of the people living in uh, EU countries live in a NATO country. I am proud that over the past couple of years, we have made unprecedented progress on NATO-EU cooperation. 
Today, we are working side by side in the Aegean and Mediterranean, in Afghanistan and Iraq, in Georgia, Ukraine, and the Western Balkans, and on exercises, cyber, and hybrid threats. EU defense can strengthen NATO and keep Europe safe if they are anchored within the transatlantic partnership. Then, before I close, let me say a few words about the re-emergence of nuclear challenges. For many years, the nuclear threat receded from view. Unfortunately, it is back on our agenda. And it would be irresponsible to ignore it. Proliferation is happening now, today, and cornerstone nuclear agreements are under threat, including the INF Treaty. I belong to a political generation from whom, uh, for whom debates on nuclear forces in Europe in the 1970s and the 1980s defined our understanding of security issues. The deployment of SS-20, Pershing, and cruise missiles was a profound concern for publics and politicians alike. In 1987, the INF Treaty banned all these weapons. Since then, it has been a pillar for European security. The problem is that the US has determined that Russia is in violation of the INF Treaty by developing and flight testing a new intermediate range ground launch cruise missile. We must protect the INF Treaty and we call on Russia to address the concerns of all NATO allies in a substantial, transparent and verifiable way. We see that Russia is modernizing its nu nuclear capabilities, developing new nuclear systems, and increasing the role of nuclear weapons in its military strategy. This is a cause for real concern. At the same time, North Korea continues to develop its nuclear and ballistic missile programs, which pose a threat to us all. All allies are now within range of North Korean missiles. Pyongyang is closer to Munich than it is to Washington DC. And therefore we must put maximum pressure on North Korea to abandon its nuclear program by political and diplomatic means and not least through effective economic sanctions. Russia and China have a special responsibility as members of the UN Security Council and as neighbors of North Korea. Iran also possesses a proliferation concern. That is why NATO allies place great importance on the Iran nuclear deal. But to be effective, it must be properly implemented. All these developments forces us to pay more attention to nuclear threats. And let me be clear, NATO's goal is a world without nuclear weapons. But as long as they exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. A world where Russia, China and North Korea have nuclear weapons but NATO does not, is not a safer world. That is why the ultimate guarantee of NATO's security is the strategic uh, nuclear forces of allies, particularly those of the United States. We need to maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. At the same time, 
Allies remain committed to reducing the number of nuclear weapons in a balanced and verifiable way. And we have a strong track record. Since the height of the Cold War, NATO allies have reduced the nuclear ar arsenal in Europe by 90%. In its recent nuclear post review, the US reconfirmed its commitment to nuclear's, nuclear arms control and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the United States has also reiterated its global leadership role in reducing the number of nuclear weapons. Only last week, Washington and Moscow announced that the limits of the new START treaty have been reached, restricting the United States and Russia to 1,550 deployed warhead, warheads each, down from 12,000 in 1994, when the first START treaty came into force. That shows the importance of such landmark agreements. It shows that arms control can work, and it shows that the risk of conflict can be effectively reduced. Ladies and gentlemen, our world may have become more dangerous, but conflict is not inevitable. To preserve the peace, we need the military strength of the NATO alliance, combined with the political courage to seek dialogue, to de-escalate, reduce tensions, and find peaceful solutions to our differences. Then we move away from the brink of conflict. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have about 20 minutes for Q and A's. And uh, I, before I call on any of you, uh, let me start by asking a question myself. Um, Mr. Secretary General, when one uh, looks at newspaper reports of the current situation in certain parts of Syria, it looks as if two NATO allies are at risk of militarily confronting each other. Now, of course, this is not the first time in the history of the alliance that we have had friction between allies, between Greece and Turkey. This is uh, it's an old story. But this is the first time that two really major allies, the United States and Turkey, are having a real problem. So if you could tell us how you think this can or should be handled and how it will be handled in order to uh, reestablish a uh, perception of a, of, a, of a NATO alliance that is not divided in a very important way. The way to handle this is that the United States and Turkey sit down and find ways to avoid any, uh, what should I say, incidents or uh, conflicts or uh, further problems in uh, northern Syria. And I welcome the fact that that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, for instance, during the defense ministerial meeting in, uh, in Brussels of NATO uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Secretary Mattis met with his uh, Turkish counter counterpart. Uh, Secretary Tillerson was recently in Ankara and uh, we have seen the reports that they are now sitting down and, uh, and really uh, making efforts uh, to solve the problems uh, we all face uh, in uh, northern Syria, but they are on the ground, they are uh, present. NATO provides to support the global coalition to uh, defeat ISIS, and Turkey has been a key uh, uh, partner or member of that uh, coalition. Uh, the progress we have made in uh, defeating ISIS in Iraq and Syria would not have been possible to achieve 
without uh, Turkey uh, being uh, uh, a key player, uh, because Turkey is bordering Iraq, bordering Syria, and has provided critical infrastructure, airports, uh, and uh, uh, many other facilities which has been important. Uh, uh, but now, uh, uh, the important thing is to find ways for uh, for U.S. and Turkey to de-conflict, and I welcome that, uh, uh, that uh, that's exactly what uh, they are doing uh, through the many different high-level meetings which are taking place now. Uh, thank you. I have uh, Claudia Roth, uh, Mr. Kozachev from Moscow, and I have a couple of more. Yes, Carl, I see you. And I have a question from Fritz Felgentreu. Why don't we take, if you, if you agree, Jens, why don't we bundle them, take three uh, together, and we'll start, of course, with Claudia Roth from the... Thank you very much, Mr. Ischinger. I want to ask a question to Mr. Stoltenberg. I don't think that what is happening in Syria right now is... Um, uh, which is an attack by a NATO country, Turkey, on Syria, on Afrin, can be reduced and broken down into a conflict between two NATO countries. It's not a conflict between two NATO countries, the U.S. and Turkey, but it's an attack of one NATO country on those forces, the Kurdish forces, that are supported by another NATO partner for a good reason, that are trained by this NATO partner, the United States. And they have been asked to put their lives at risk in order to provide our security in the fight against ISIL. This is not a conflict between the United States and Turkey, between boys that started a fight. It's about credibility, the credibility of NATO. How does NATO behave in such an attack of on Afrin, of an attack on the civilian population? It's a dramatic humanitarian situation. Why is that not a topic in the NATO Council? so that the NATO can provide clarity, because I think NATO loses what you said it would lose, the credibility as a rules and value-based order and uh, organization. But the fact that a NATO member launches a military attack on Syria and has conducted it against the interests of NATO, on the other hand, is nothing that I can understand or accept at all. And your statement is not enough for me to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, Jens, I will read a question that is related not to Syria, but to Iraq, if you agree, from Fritz Felgentreu. In a recently ongoing discussion, I'm quoting here, NATO is considering taking responsibility for a mission of capability building with the Iraqi armed forces. This project is meant to be a sequel to the war on Daesh, aimed at stabilizing Iraq in the process of reconstruction. The objective is reasonable, but why should such a mission be regarded to be a task for NATO? Question mark. Fritz Felgentreu. And then we'll take a question from uh, Mr. Kozachev, please. Mr. Secretary General, my question would be about the uh, last part of your speech uh, related to the uh, dangers of proliferation of nuclear weapons. You mentioned, as far as I could see, uh, three nuclear countries, uh, Russia, China, and Iran, to my surprise, as a... And as a thank you. Then it was a mis misinterpretation. Okay. But in any case... Uh, would you be so kind and make certain comments on United States uh, attempts to set additional pressure on North Korea, expressing uh, its intentions to wipe North Korea out of the Earth's face in the uh, UN General Assembly this year? as well as the uh, United States uh, threats or intentions to uh, withdraw from the Iranian deal. How do you believe these actions and threats either strengthen or weaken 
the uh, proliferation system in case of North Korea and in case of Iran. Thank you. Okay, so we have three questions. Yes. First, uh, about uh, uh, Syria. Well, I was asked about uh, the, the challenges between uh, Turkey and, uh, and the United States in Syria. That was the reason why I, I, I respond to that. But I agree that the situation in Syria uh, is uh, about much more uh, than uh, the relationship between uh, Turkey and, uh, and Syria and the and, and United States. Of course, we uh, share the concerns about the uh, uh, humanitarian situation, the suffering of the people, the violence, uh, the killing of civilians. And therefore, the main message is that we all support uh, the efforts to find a peaceful, political, negotiated solution. And we strongly support the efforts of the UN and uh, by Stefan de Mastura to uh, energize uh, these uh, uh, efforts to find a political solution. So NATO's main message is to support those efforts. Uh, then uh, the reality is that in the lack of a political solution, we have a very difficult uh, situation in northern Syria. And, uh, and uh, NATO allies have, uh, uh, have uh, all participated uh, in the campaign to defeat ISIS, both in Syria and uh, Iraq. And NATO is a member of the coalition to defeat ISIS, and we have also provided uh, support to the coalition with our uh, AWACS uh, surveillance uh, uh, planes and with training of Iraqi officers. Uh, but again, we don't think there is a military solution. We need a, a political uh, uh, solution. Uh, Turkey has some, some legitimate security concerns. Uh, no other NATO ally has suffered more terrorist attacks than, uh, than Turkey, but we expect them to uh, uh, address these concerns in a proportionate and uh, measured way. And, uh, and we also welcome the fact that Turkey has briefed uh, all NATO allies on the operation in, uh, in Afrin, where uh, several allies have underlined the importance of a measured uh, and proportionate uh, response. Then on Iraq, well, the main message is that we are more uh, safe when our neighbors are more secure. And uh, Iraq is a neighbor of NATO, uh, uh, a neighbor of Turkey, which is, is a neighbor, uh, which is a NATO ally. Uh, so uh, uh, NATO uh, feels a responsibility to try to also help to stabilize our uh, neighborhood. Uh, we do that, of course, in close uh, cooperation with the Iraqi government. And NATO has the structures, the experience, the knowledge of how to train uh, forces. And I think that we have seen a significant shift in the way uh, NATO is contributing to the fight against terrorism over the last years. Uh, before, NATO conducted big combat operations, as we, for instance, have done uh, in Afghanistan over many years. Now we are shifting from combat to train. Uh, so, for instance, in Afghanistan, we ended the combat operation. We do now training of local forces. And that's exactly also what we are uh, going to do uh, or scale up in Iraq. Uh, because I believe that in the long run, it's much more viable, much more sustainable that we train local forces, enabling them to stabilize their own countries instead of NATO conducting big uh, combat operations. So to enable the Iraqi forces to uh, avoid ISIL or Al-Qaeda or anything like that to come back, we have to help them build their military institutions, train their officers. And one of the issues where NATO is going to work a lot is on how to build uh, as a military academies, um, military schools to train the trainers and, 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 and to help Iraq build a, a strong defense and security uh, uh, sector. Oh, sorry, a nuclear, sorry. Uh, US, well, uh, first of all, we attach great importance to the Iran nuclear deal, and uh, it is important that it's fully uh, implemented. Uh, uh, second, uh, the, when it comes to North Korea, well, I think the, the, the good news is that at least the UN Security Council, uh, with all the permanent members, have uh, or has been able to agree on uh, tougher sanctions. And we need maximum pressure on North Korea, which then, of course, depends on uh, strict economic sanctions. And uh, we have seen uh, tougher sanctions, and we have seen also that the sanctions are uh, uh, implemented to a larger extent now than before. Uh, I'm not saying this is easy, but I'm saying that pressure on North Korea 
is the way to uh, uh, denuclearize and to uh, make sure that the North Korea uh, abandon uh, their nuclear and missile programs. Thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe three or four more questions. I saw there is a question in the back, but there was Carl Bildt. So I'll call on Carl. And then I'll call on the lady. Is this Natalie? Uh, and on the gentleman over there, third, yes. Is that, is that Frank? Okay. Uh, right. Carl Bill. Secretary, and you mentioned rightly, I think, the uh, dangers associated with INF Treaty, if that were to sort of be endangered the one way or the other. There are several issues there. But you highlighted the Russian one, needless to say. And the um, ground-launched cruise missile, that the one way or the other is there. I, I notice your f f how you phrased it. You say Russia has flight tested, no, de developed and flight tested a cruise, a ground launch cruise missile. But you avoided or you did not mention the word deployed. Was that a deliberate phrasing or was it just on a mission? Uh, all right. Then the next one is Natalie. Yes, there. Concerning European defense, uh, indeed there have been remarkable steps being made over the last uh, couple of years. And what's interesting is that these steps have been made in close communication with NATO and have gone hand in hand with an unprecedented deepening of EU-NATO cooperation. Now, you put a lot of emphasis on the risks. And listening to you, it seems to um, a bit like going back to the 1990s, you know, the old debate of the three Ds. And what's not clear to me is why is there this resurgence of doubts within NATO concerning the desirability of European defense? Thank you. And then we have Frank Wisner over there. Secretary General, on the 7th of February, the European Commission published a very strong report pointing to the deteriorating situation in the Western Balkans and calling for a number of measures to accelerate the progress of, the European, of Western Balkans into Europe during this year, heading towards the summit in Sofia. Integration is not just an economic and social matter. The Western Balkans is a dangerous place in security is a hugely important factor, particularly in the face of rising threats, including increased Russian activity. Is it possible to imagine close coordination between a fresh round of EU efforts and NATO efforts to jointly bring the nations of the Western Balkans into the transatlantic community? All right. Back to you. First, uh, to Carl Bildt. Uh, well, I used uh, the official uh, language the United States is using. Uh, and, and the reason why I did that was that I would like to be very uh, so precise, because this is not a NATO, uh, I should say, assessment. This is a U.S. assessment, uh, because uh, U.S. is uh, part in the INF uh, Treaty. Then there may be reports about all other things, but I used the official U.S. language because this is a U.S. Uh, determination. Um, th regardless, uh, the important thing is to make sure that we protect the INF Treaty and that uh, Russia is, uh, is uh, transparent uh, and verifiable uh, in compliance with uh, the treaty. That's the main message. Uh, then um, then uh, on EU defense, well, also I, 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 I am I say, as positive as I can, uh, meaning that I, I have welcomed the uh, efforts to strengthen European uh, or EU defense uh, in, uh, in all my speeches. But I think also that in all my speeches, I have also uh, highlighted that we need to avoid duplication. I think I have used the word duplication in all my speeches just to make sure that there is no risk for duplication and no risk for competition. And, uh, and for instance, that this uh, has to be done in a way which strengthens the European pillar within NATO. I think that's a direct quote of, uh, of Ursula von der Leyen that has stated many times that this is not about uh, creating an alternative to NATO, but this is about strengthening the European pillar within NATO. 
So, so I think actually it is important that I, but also European leaders, as they have done many times, state again and again that this is not about competing with NATO. Because then it's easier for us to provide full support and easier for us to also then uh, calm down those who might, might be uh, still a bit, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, afraid that this may create duplication or be an alternative to NATO. And, and the reason why European leaders themselves so strongly have underlined that this is not about collective defense, this is not about uh, creating alternative uh, uh, command structures or, or, or an alternative to NATO, is that it is obvious that when it comes to uh, protecting Europe, which is more than the EU, uh, then we need the transatlantic bond. And we need non-EU allies, as Britain, uh, soon to be, uh, Norway in the north, Turkey in the south. So, so, and of course, Canada and the United States, 80% of NATO's defense spending is non-EU. So, so, so there is no way EU can replace NATO, but EU efforts can complement and strengthen NATO, and therefore I strongly welcome those efforts. That's my, I think that has been my message in all my speeches, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I continue to say so. Uh, then, um, then on Western Balkans, um, uh, well, uh, NATO has a history there, the EU has a history there, we have a, res a responsibility. And, and sometimes I'm a bit afraid that we are so focused on Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, which is important, that we forget our closest na neighborhood, the Western Balkans. Uh, and we have to be focused on the Western Balkans, uh, because there are some developments which are really going in the wrong direction. Uh, but, but at least we, uh, and I really believe that NATO and the EU can, uh, can do more together. We already work together, but we can do more together. Uh, NATO, we have as EU uh, members in the region, uh, Slovenia and, uh, and Croatia, but uh, NATO also uh, uh, Albania and, um, and uh, Montenegro. Uh, and I recently visited uh, Skopje, and I really hope that it is possible to find a solution to the name issue, because then we can also move uh, uh, on that issue when it comes to uh, membership. Uh, but this is not only about membership, this is also about working with partners, for instance, Serbia. Uh, I welcome that we are strengthening our partnership with Serbia. I welcome also that EU is, uh, is uh, what should I say, working on that. So the Western Balkan is absolutely an, uh, um, a region where uh, we have to do more and have to do more together with the European Union. Okay. Uh, any final questions? Uh, two more. Horst Tetschik first, and then Steve Erlana. Herr Generalsekretär, wir haben heute. Mr. Secretary General, today we have heard a lot about measures to strengthen NATO. We have heard a lot about military cooperation in the European Union and of expanding that and of strengthening that. But what we have not heard about until now, what, wh what can we do when it comes to arms control, disarmament, and cooperation in this context with Russia? We have the NATO-Russia Council. Why do we not use the NATO-Russia Council at the moment in order to address questions such as the threat of a new nuclear arms race when it comes to medium-range ballistic missiles. We have heard announcements from the U.S. administration saying that nuclear missiles, uh, a low-yield nuclear missiles are supposed to be development, developed is nothing but a new, a new announcement for a new nuclear arms race. So this is a question that has to do with confidence building measures. In the early 90s, we have seen that many confidence building measures were conducted and we agreed on them. Now we have the NATO-Russia Council that had only three meetings last year, but only at ambassador level. Why did they not get together at foreign minister or defense minister level? Ambassadors cannot take any decisions, but foreign and defense ministers can develop 
in initiatives instead. But I, so I would be grateful if we could hear more from you as to what measures are taken within NATO or intended to be taken within NATO when it comes to disarmament and arms control. Steve Erlanger. Um, thank you, Wolfgang. Um, Mr. Stoltenberg, you, you, you were pretty explicit about your concerns about EU strategic autonomy, as some people have put it. Um, but I want to press you a little more on two things. One, do you think the French idea of a European intervention force is duplicative or a good idea or a bad idea, explicitly? And secondly, American officials have been quoted lately as saying they have grave doubts about PESCO and um, what it entails for NATO. Are those comments helpful to, helpful to you or are they hurtful and have they been coordinated with you? Thank you. Uh, Jens, before you reply, since we're talking here about NATO-related issues and about the transatlantic relationship, uh, allow me to use just 30 seconds to set the record straight. There was a, a news item on German television, and this is why I will say what I say now in Deutsch. Uh, and this morning, in, on a TV show, there was an assumption made that I would like to clarify. It was said that it seems as though the Americans, the Trump administration, lost interest in the Munich Security Conference and thus lost interest in Europe. At, back in the uh, some time ago, uh, Senator McCain and uh, Secretary Metis were supposed to come to Munich, and then it was said uh, those two are not on the speaker list, so they won't come to the security conference. But I would like to set the record straight here. Until a few minutes ago, Secretary Metis said right here, most of uh, you saw him, so he is here in Munich. And concerning Senator McCain, Senator McCain will uh, be awarded with the Kleist Award tomorrow night, but due to health reasons, health-related reasons, because of his severe tumor disease, he cannot accept the award himself. Instead, his wife, Cindy, uh, will receive the award in his place. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, the American administration, with an exception of the representatives of former administrations, such as John Kerry and Joe Biden and many Democratic senators, the Trump administration also has an intense presence here. The defense minister is here. The national security advisor is here. The homeland security secretary is here. The deputy energy minister, as well as the deputy um, state secretary, is here too. And the DNI is here as well, then Coates, as well as the CAI director. So. I cannot complain at all about a, an American delegation of the U.S. administration that is as strong and as present as it has been over the past few years. So what we've seen on German television was completely wrong. So first on arms control, I agree that arms control is very important and that's also the reason why I actually spoke a lot about arms control in my introduction, uh, about the importance of nuclear arms control. Uh, and the first thing we can do is to make sure that the agreements we have uh, are fully implemented, meaning that we make sure that the INF Treaty, which is not just a, a small agreement, but it's actually an agreement that abolish uh, a whole category of weapons, uh, intermediate, uh, intermediate range uh, new, uh, weapons, uh, that we make sure that that treaty is fully respected. Uh, the other message is that we have to make sure that the non-proliferation treaty is fully respected uh, and uh, that we avoid proliferation. And that's uh, the Iran deal and that's also uh, to make sure that, for instance, North Korea is not uh, developing nuclear weapons. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I mentioned the fact that the, also a week ago on the 5th of February, that was the date where we fully implemented the new START agreement which puts a ceiling, 1,550 uh, warheads in total on each side in Russia and United States. That's a big achievement, and it and, and it shows that nuclear uh, that arms control works. 
Uh, and I think we should use that, use that as an inspiration to do more. And then I welcome the fact that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Secretary Mattis, in his testimony to the Congress, uh, reiterated the U.S. Uh, commitment uh, to further uh, uh, reductions in uh, nuclear uh, weapons. So we, we should be, so protect the agreements we have and build on them to achieve uh, uh, more. Uh, meaning also that we have to, for instance, protect uh, what we call the Vienna document, uh, which is a very important document on conventional uh, uh, issues and how to uh, make sure that we have transparency, risk reduction. Uh, we we, uh, we do get that Russia is uh, finding ways to at least undermine the intentions and the way this uh, document is working. We want to modernize it. So far, we have not been able to, to reach agreement with Russia on modernizing the Vienna document. Open skies, an important uh, agreement, which is working. And then we have to regret that the uh, CFE uh, is not in, uh, in place. The NATO Ro Russia Council is important. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the good news is that after two years with no meetings at all, uh, from 2014 to the summer of 2016, uh, we have had uh, six meetings since then. Those meetings are not solving all the problems, but at least there are the, the meetings of NATO Russia Council. Uh, they are a platform for NATO allies and Russia to sit down around the table and address issues as Ukraine, as risk reduction, transparency, military posture, Afghanistan, and all the issues. I think that's, that is important. The dialogue with Russia is not easy, but that's exactly why it is important, and, and I will continue to work for dialogue with Russia. Russia is our neighbor. Russia is there to stay. We have to strive for a better relationship with, uh, with uh, 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 Russia. Um, yeah, sorry, EU? No. Yeah, yeah, EU. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, PESCO and... and, and uh, no, well, we had a defense ministerial meeting uh, on Wednesday and Thursday. And we all welcomed PESCO. Uh, we welcome PESCO, we welcome the European Defence Fund, but the message has been uh, all the way from me and from all other uh, who have addressed this, uh, that it has to be done in a way which is not duplicating NATO. I think that was in my first comment when I was uh, commenting on the PESCO. Uh, I welcome the launch of PESCO, uh, but at the same time I co actually quoted EU leaders and European leaders who have themselves stated that this is not going to duplicate NATO, this is not an alternative to NATO, we are dependent on NATO, NATO is important for European security, and they are, because they are aware of that 80% of NATO's defense spending is coming from non-NATO. Well, uh, yeah, then I, I can, uh, so we, we, we welcome, yeah, we, he asked me about uh, the, the, the new European capabilities, a uh, French force. Uh, we welcome also, of course, new European uh, capabilities, uh, forces, uh, uh, equipment, and so on. Uh, uh, what we have underlined, and again, in all my comments and in all my meetings with EU ministers and press uh, statements and so on, is that, it ha that there are three important points. One is coherence when it comes to uh, capability developments. Because NATO has a defense planning process, and we cannot end up in a world where there is one list from NATO and then the competing capability requirements from the EU. And, and that's a problem for me, but it's an even bigger problem for the nations. Because then they will have two institutions coming with two lists and asking for different capabilities. So it's obvious that it has to be coherence in the capability developments uh, between NATO and the European Union. No way it can work without coherence. I say that, but also EU leaders say that. Second uh, is the principle of availability. NATO has asked European allies to provide more capabilities for years. Then we cannot, what should I say, criticize them when they start to develop capabilities. We should welcome that. As long as those capabilities are available for NATO operations. And they have stated clearly, yes, these, uh, these capabilities, if drones or divisions or brigades or ships, whatever it is, they will, of course, be available for NATO operations. So that's fine. And the third principle uh, is uh, the, the strongest possible uh, 
inclusion of non-EU allies. Uh, taking, of course, into consideration or respecting the autonomy and the integrity of the European Union, but we have to integrate uh, and include non-EU allies as much as possible because the European Union will not be able to protect Europe by itself, partly because we are dependent on North America, but also on non-EU uh, 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 NATO allies. Uh, because EU is big, but there are also actually some European countries which are not a member of, uh, of the European Union, like Turkey, important in the south in the fight against terrorism, like Norway in the north, addressing all the challenges in Barents Sea, and like, for instance, the United Kingdom in the west. Mr. Secretary General, thank you so much. I want to remind the audience that those of you who are interested in the relationship between NATO and the EU in the defense area, uh, please come back in a half an hour because we continue this debate with two defense ministers from the European Union, with Jens' uh, deputy, Rose Gottemiller, and a few other experts. So be back in half an hour. Now let's give a hand to Secretary Stoltenberg. <laughs>